Welcome to part two of our exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with film editor Jeffrey Ford, ACE. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. We'd love to bring you more videos and interviews with interesting film editors and other filmmakers. Okay, so another question I have, you've worked in a lot of genres. Uh, it, you, your credit list is very varied, but a lot of editors get pigeonholed or typecast into cutting what type of film. How did you avoid this? Was it intentional? Uh, well, uh, maybe, I mean, I kind of am pigeonholed now because I've done so many Marvel films and I'm, you know, I went and did the, you know, the Comey movie and I did another movie called Let Him Go with Kevin Costner and Diane Lane. But like I've done a few other ones since Marvel and I'm um, and I'll come back to Marvel because I love working with those guys. So I don't want to like say I don't want people to say, hey, you just do Marvel movies. And I'm like, well, I'm not anymore. Watch me do other things. I'm like, no, I like working on those. Why can't I? <laughs> I mean, I, I love them. I, uh, when I was, you know, in fourth grade, I was making Spider-Man movies with my brother. I'm like, <laughs> why can't I do that again? So I don't want to, you know, I want to do what I want to do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I want to enjoy myself. So I get, I pick what I, I pick the stuff I really want to work on. But I will say, like, um, you know, I, I, there was a script that came across my desk when I was younger, and it was, um, I was just started editing, but I was at Fox on a couple of movies, and then they, I got a call from uh, Fox, and they're like, hey, there's this movie uh, coming up. It's a romantic comedy. Do you want to go up for it? And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do a romantic comedy. Ew. And uh, so I said, well, send me the script. I'll look at it. And uh, and uh, so I got the script and I was going to read it. My wife had um, at the time was working at the L.A. Independent Film Festival and she'd been programming movie independent films at that festival. And she saw the script and she saw the author and she said, oh, hey, this guy, I programmed this guy's movie a couple years ago. And his name was Thomas Bazooka. And she said, hey, this guy, Tom Bazooka, made a great movie and we put it in the festival two years ago watch that movie, read that script, you might want to do this. And I'm like, really? So I watched this movie, which we called Big Eden. And then I read the script it was a script called, uh, at the time it was called Fucking Hate Her, um, which eventually became The Family Stone with Diane Keaton. And I read the script, but I saw his movie and his movie had a, a spirit and, a, and an energy and, a, and a, an elegance to it that was so, and it was so sophisticated emotionally. I was like, oh, wait a minute. This isn't the old, this isn't the usual romantic comedy. This is something else. This is, this is a romantic comedy, but it's elevated in a way. And I, I read it with new eyes. And thank, thankfully, my wife, <laughs> had the, you know, she, she always puts me on the right track. And I was like, OK, I want to do this. And I met with Tom again. Now he's become one of my best friends. We did uh -huh. uh, that movie. Uh, we did uh, a movie called um, Monte Carlo. And I just did a movie called Let Him Go uh, with him. So, again, it's like you, even though I jumped around in some genres, it was always a case of, you know, it was evaluating to see if I could could, can I do something with this? Can I connect with this material and this director? And if that's the case, it doesn't matter what the genre is because, you know, I'm very proud of the work that I did at Marvel on on the movies. You know, I know a lot of people say it's not cinema or it's it's not it's, it's a lower form or blah blah blah. I get it, but I, I that's not. I don't have a problem with what I like. What I did, I'm very very, very proud of, and and it's very meaningful and important to me emotionally about all those stories. I mean, I. Chris Evans' arc as Captain America in those movies, uh, it's very imper very personal and important uh, uh, work to me that I was able to do that for Chris, to carry that forward. I think he did a great job with it. I think it's a great character. I love how it is part of our culture and I'm so proud of it. Um, I, had, I, I had a much, I had a connection to that character. And so I was able to work that character over the course of those stories. Um, if I had done like, I mean, I've been as, as like connected to Thor. So I didn't choose to go down that road. Not, not that it's not a good character. It's just that there's something about Cap and Chris Evans and Joe Johnston's initial story and the Russos. That, that whole arc for me, I connected with it. Yeah. So it was, is, you know, it's, it's, it's finding that stuff that you really get into. If you love horror movies, you, you could, you know, you could work on a horror movie and, and really get into it. But which kind of horror movie? There's stuff like Hereditary. There's stuff like, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's stuff that's that's more like Saw. I mean, there's all these different kinds. There's all these different flavors. Find your place if you if you want to work in those genres. As an editor, I think you will get you will get if you have a hit, you'll always be like, oh, he's the guy that does these. You know, I'm the action editor or something now, or so I don't know what that means, but because uh, <laughs> it's still storytelling. I mean, a fight is a, just a scene between two actors. Yeah, but that's how Hollywood works. You know, people have a very, right. e you know, they yeah. it's like a knee jerk reaction to these kinds of things. Right. Okay, so let's let's talk about the filmmaking. You know, in the trenches, 
Give us an overview of your approach when you start a project. How do you prepare before the shooting and editing begin? I mean, obviously, well, read the script. if it's read the script, absolutely talk to the director, have conversations about it. Um, it's also if there's a book, I read the book. Um, if there's research material, if it's docu, if it's a docudrama, I read the research material that created. You know, for the Comey movie, I you know it was the Mueller report. It was reading Comey's book, uh, Higher Loyalty. It was um, doing a lot of research on stock footage because the movie, when you see it, is intercut with news footage. So sure. it was almost a documentary fused with a narrative. And so there was a lot of research done about what was going on in that period. It's a very, it's a, it's very much about a particular period in the uh, in the Trump administration, the very you know end of the campaign, the beginning of the, of, of the administration before Comey was fired. So it's that research was was very intense breach. I did some similar kind of research on Robert Hansen um, with with Stephen Glass, same kind of thing. So I do for the for the for the stuff that's based on, you know, uh, real world stuff or, or real events, then that's a deep dive that I, I try to do also just to get a sense of what I'm doing so I can be responsible. Like I make sure that like, oh, wait a minute, if we're, if I'm, if I'm picking a take, I need to know what, like I need to get a sense of what this means. And when you have a real person, it's fascinating because, you know, we had a, ch on the Comey film, we were able to ask Comey what, what he thought. And, wow. and, 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 and so, you know, we were, and I was able to show him a scene, you know, and say, hey, what do you think about this choice? Yes, that's right. Or no, 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 no. And that's like helpful to be able to sense like how, you know, if you, you're able to access the subject, that's critical. Um, you don't always have that luxury. Um, and you also sometimes you don't want to, to do it that way. Right. But I think it's um, th it's important to be to, to be aware of all the depth of the material and that most of it comes from conversations with the director and 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 and, and working on the screenplay. I very rarely read a script. And we went off and shot it. Usually you write, re read a script and you make notes and you're re rewriting it and you're adjusting it as you shoot. You're making uh, modifications. So having some of those things in mind, making notes, detailed notes about what you think should be changed, being able to help that. And, and also you always want to go to the director and say, OK, listen, here's what I'm getting. What do you, is that what you want to do? Because this is how it's presenting. What are you trying to say? Don't you don't want to go in and say it should be this way. I am right. Look at me. I have the answer. No. You don't know what that director is trying to say. They may not have communicated it clearly. Part of your job is to help them figure out how to say what they want to say. And I always want to do that. I always want to say, well, what are you? What's the story about? What is the thematic idea that we're trying to impart? And if they're if you're not sure, then we'll go on a, a quest together to figure that out. But it's important to know that when you're making the choices. I mean, when I started working on Public Enemies, I asked Michael about you know his approach to Dillinger and and how he was going to because I read a lot about Dillinger but it was like what is your take on this it's Johnny Depp are you saying that he's like a it's almost like he's the beginning of a counterculture that doesn't land for another 30 years I mean he's this guy who sort of just doesn't take he doesn't take the the government seriously um is he like the first beat <laughs> you know or something <laughs> and Michael's like what the hell that's the worst idea I've ever heard not a, not what I'm doing at all don't do that don't do that he's a he's He's not thinking about tomorrow. There is no future. He's living in the moment. He's completely centered. This oh. is, these guys are like centered in a moment. Don't try to think about him in a, don't put him in a postmodern, you know, context. Don't try to rationalize or put him. I'm like, okay, geez, I misread what you were going. And, but it was great to have that conversation. I like re, it recentered my approach to choosing takes to like, you know, a, a, you know, how I would like look at the character, what I would, you know, my opinion I would give, because he was telling a different story than I thought he was telling. This is, by the way, in the early days, you don't quite have all the performances. You don't know what the actors are going to do yet. You just have the overarching script, and in that case, a, a book um, that, that it was based on. So he was going in a different direction, and I needed to know that, you know what I mean? And I'm glad that I, I'm glad that we had that conversation. So it's always good to draw out what you want them, yeah. what they want you to do cleared it up absolutely yeah. <laughs> so you cut crazy heart with jeff bridges which <clears throat> was just an amazing film do you approach a small intimate drama like that from an editor's perspective from you know the basic cutting of the emotional beats and things like that do you do you approach it differently than a, a marvel film no, I don't. But well, on Crazy Heart, I just that was a movie that my friend and my former roommate from college, John Axelrod, cut with Scott Cooper. And John and Scott cut that movie and, and did a lot of the work on Bridges' performance before I came on. And what happened was they sold the movie to Searchlight. And then they, you know, John went on to other projects. The movie was there for, for months before they decided how they were going to release it. 
And at one point they're like, we want to get this out for Oscars and we need to get it up. We need to do a recut on it because it's not, they hadn't quite finished it. They had done it. They'd done a mix that wasn't very good and, and they had they had they had just they had got it to the point where they could sell it to a studio for distribution, but they hadn't really done the work to finish it. Mm -hmm. And John was on another picture. So I I came on and did a really intense pass on performances um to to you know to tone that thing in with with the director because they needed to do that final push that you would normally do if you were in post. And it was interesting because we found a lot of things in that process, but it really you know, when you approach a movie that's that's already cut, your you know your approach is different than if you're building it from from the ground up. But I will say to your answer your to answer yeah to answer your question though, I literally approach everything, including a fight scene um, in a Marvel movie or a visual effect sequence, in utterly the same way. It's a storytelling moment, and it's transactional or emotional relationships between characters, and if you know. Some, it could be a kiss, it could be a punch, it could be a line of dialogue, but that's still an interchange that you need to, you know, there's rhythm to it. The amount of time it takes before the punch is thrown has meaning. The amount of time it takes before the word is spoken has meaning. All of those rhythmic elements, you know, contribute to how you tell a story. And people innately kind of sense rhythm as meaning. So if you, if I were to, if I were to say something and I was, and I were to pause before I said the final word, <laughs> it would have a different meaning than if I said, I'm going to pause before I say the final word. Right. Like it just has a different tone. So a, a fight scene is the same as, as a, as an intimate scene. And also what, by the way, crazy heart was a musical in essence. So sure. T-Bone Burnett had written songs that basically told the story. So I approached the structuring of, of the mix and the way we did it as a musical. Like in other words, how we need to flow right into these numbers in a way that, that so it doesn't feel like it's oh now he's gonna sing no no he's he's still in the scene it's just that the song is now the scene right so right. Yeah. yeah you know Artie Schmidt uh, I talked to him recently and and he described it in a similar way I mean he you know and I and I feel similar the film talks to you the film speaks to you the film tells you how to cut yeah, it so for I, sure I, I I appreciate your your perspective on that so has your editing style changed over the years. If so, tell us how or why not. I don't know. Uh, I think it has. I think it's probably gotten. Um, I think I've probably developed a, a very different way of putting a scene together initially than I used to. I used to have a much more sort of clinical. I, I would break things down into. Um, and I do a lot more scene breakdown work on the dailies before I began cutting. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I've gotten as I've done more work, I'm much more, I'm much less interested in, in determining, um, you know, all the different options that I have and instead immediately sort of planning a route when I first watch daily. So what I used to do is sort of stay objective and watch everything as, and be as objective as possible. The thing I shifted to, uh, in the last few years is that I, I go now go, okay, well, what's the scene about? What's the story about? What's the character about? Let me find those pieces. Um, as opposed to finding all these potential ideas that like, oh, I could go this way. Oh, I could go that way. Oh, I could go this way. Hmm. And like, you know what I mean? Like I started to be a little bit more focused at choosing a, a lane early on. And right. uh, not that I can't, I mean, some scenes you still have to, like if you have a scene that's been shot problematically or uh, or the director hasn't quite gotten the scene, that old style works better where you break it all down and go, okay, I can go here, I can go here. But uh, but I think it's I think it's important to have a, have a storytelling agenda when you put the scene together, yeah. like have a plan and, and come from story as opposed to um, coming from, oh, that's a cool shot. Or I like how that's, you know, that the light is playing off the glass in a nice way there. I want to use that. No. Is that a story? <laughs> There's, is a story about the glass? I don't know. So I feel like you have to like have like, what are you what's what are you trying? What's the story you're trying to tell? Because if you're doing a narrative, by the way, there's movies that don't have that. that don't have like there's like you said, the footage will speak to you if you're doing a you're working on a Terrence Malick movie, uh, which I haven't had the privilege of. But if you're working on a Terrence Malick movie, maybe the sunlight in the tree is the thing that's the movie. Um, but if you're working on if it's if it's a narrative structure, then I think you approach it from story. Yeah, um, and it also helps to have a director that is has a clear vision also and, and a clear direction also. It, oh, for sure. It yeah. helps us as editors. You know, you you, you kind of get it. One hundred percent. Oh no, yeah. The a better director makes you a better editor for 
Sure. I mean, that's the thing is, and that's the thing. You see the difference between them. I mean, I, I, I can, you know, uh, having worked with a number of directors and you, you, you know, does too. It's like, sometimes you get dailies and it's like, this cuts together so well. I can't believe it. And you're like, this is amazing. But they're good. I mean, they, they, they get it. Um, you know, the, the blocking's great and the, the, the camera's in the right place and they got all the pieces and they got the, more importantly, they got the performances. Yeah. And there's very often directors who will move on and they didn't get the performance. And I'm like, I can cut this together, but... The moment where he's supposed to decide to kill the guy is not here. <laughs> like, I can try to make it, but that's something I can't do. Right. You finish watching Dallas and you're all like, did I miss something? What? Where's the moment? <laughs> you got everything but the thing. <laughs> Terrible yeah. feeling. Um, so in terms, of the, in terms of the Marvel films, obviously there's a lot of challenges, but what do you feel are some of your biggest challenges in editing a mega budget action adventure movie? Biggest challenges? Well... I think that probably the biggest challenge for those films is that so much of them are visual effects based that you have to make some decisions that get sort of put in cement early on and you haven't had a chance to necessarily find the movie. But I will say Marvel's better than any other studio at being flexible later on. So if I have to change something, even though we've done a lot of visual effects work on it and we find it's better storytelling to make a change, they'll, they'll never say no. I mean, they'll always find a way. But I do think you have to be able to see the movie in its finished form early, very early. Whereas with a with a non-visual effects movie, you can explore and change things more dramatically later in the process because you know the imagery is there. That's basically the biggest, I mean, and, and time. I mean, if you have to make a movie that has to come out in a year, then you're up against it. And, and a Marvel movie, we make them in a year pretty much, and that's not easy. I mean, the Star Wars movies used to take three years to make back in the, in the day when Lucas made them in the late 70s and early 80s. And I think that's probably a more realistic approach, even now with accelerated post-production. The creative process to make a big movie does take time and it's getting less and less. So I think, you know, the deadline pressures are realistic and we have to, we, they're here to stay. But, but I think that's, that's the, the greatest issue. And then obviously um, some movies, you know, like if you have a really, if, you, if you're going in with a great script, that's solid and, and works, you'll have less issues. If you are going in with something that's still not fully formed because it's been put into production too quickly, you're gonna have more difficulty because you're gonna be changing as you go. Neither thing is bad. In fact, you can make some great movies from you know flying by the seat of your pants. I mean, <laughs> at Marvel, we made, you know, in, Avengers, in, in Infinity War and Endgame were written as we were shooting them to some wow. extent, and uh, Civil, Civil War and Winter Soldier were not as much. So like, for instance, Civil War, we, you know, Russo's and, and Marcus McFeely and, and, and Nate Moore uh, wrote the script and then we shot it. We made some modifications, but it was more of a write it, shoot it with uh, with some of the other films. We were, you know, we were writing them as we were going uh, only because just they were the the universe around them was changing. The characters around them were changing and we were we were coming up with more ideas and, and, and we had the ability to do that. So, Jeff, how long were you on Infinity Wars and Endgame? Well, let's see, we. I went to Atlanta in um, October of 2016 to work with the writers and the Russos on the story. Um, they were writing and we were prepping. So there was previs. I was. I needed to, you know. I want. It was a. It was an undertaking. We knew we were going to shoot both movies at the same time, so we knew we were going to be there for a while, and we we're going to have the, the you know, the cast in there for a while. It was a huge undertaking, and I wanted to be there for that that prep. So we worked on the script in October, November, December. And then we started shooting at the end of January of 2017. And we shot for basically one year straight, almost to the day. Wow. And towards so and we were in Atlanta and we were in Scotland and uh, mostly Atlanta on stages and uh, motion capture. So we wrapped. I mean, the Russo stayed on to finish shooting Endgame as Infinity War was going into heavy post. So I went back to L.A. Uh, early in 2017 to finish Infinity War while they were still shooting um, Endgame. And we would have a, we had a tie line so we could talk to each other in, in Atlanta and LA. But Matt Schmidt, my co-editor, stayed in Atlanta and I came back to uh, Burbank to work on uh, delivering Infinity War. So then we did, uh, we've, we delivered Infinity War in April of 2018 uh, uh, and the movie came out. And we had to wait to see that movie come out and see what the audience did with it before we knew exactly how to dial in Endgame because mm. we had a lot of Endgame shot, but we didn't quite know. Like, there's just a lot of things we changed in Infinity War that then needed to be handled in Endgame. You know, you're, as you're making a movie, you're making changes, and they're and they're and when you're making two movies at once, and you don't have a lot of you know, you have to really get that first one done and then adjust. And so, 
uh, after we finished and Infinity War came out and was a big hit, people loved it and they were freaked out by everybody disappearing at the end. So now we knew we, we, we were we were in a good place. We just needed to now we needed to, you know, stick the landing on the next one. So we went to work and we had not really shot the big end battle of Endgame because we purposefully decided to wait because that was a lot of the stuff that would be affected by changes that we made. So we went back into a really intense editing and writing process over the summer and then went back to Atlanta in uh, October, November of 2018 and shot the rest of Endgame. And that was a two month, a month and a half period with three, four units going. Um, so it was wow. Joe, Anthony, Joe was on one, Anthony was on another, Dan DeLue, our visual effects supervisor was on another and I was on mocap. So basically we were all directing, four of us were wow. directing, um, you know, various bits and we bring the directors uh, you know, Joe and Anthony over to get sign offs on stuff. And then I, you know, we keep working with the actors and it was crazy because we were all working parallel, but it was fun. And we were then, you know, when we, we, we got all that stuff into the visual effects pipeline because we only had, you know, November, December, January, February, March to get all those visual effects done for delivery in April. We were up against it. So we had to shoot them. Uh, and it was, that was all the heavy lifting visual effects. Do you have any uh, <laughs> sort of like rough idea of how many visual effects were in the film? I, 3,000 shots or something. I mean, I, I can't remember. I'd have to look it up, but there was a lot. And it was also, but a lot of it was fully CG. In, you know, we shoot reference, but, or the, or the physical element of it, but it had to be, there's no way to, there's no way to just, you, you know, it's a, these movies are hybrids of, of animation and, and live action. So right. you have to do, you have to shoot them to get to what you want. There's just no other way. You can't, you can't skirt it. You can't go, oh, we'll just have them animate it and it'll be fine. It doesn't work that way. The actors drive it, the scene, their scenes, they have to be cut and they have to be then animated. So, of course, yeah. you know, it just, it was, it was nuts, but it was fun. And we knew what we were doing. Like we, we had a clear piece of screenwriting that took us to the end. So we were like, we're good. We're going to be fine. We know what to do now. We learned a lot from the last one. We have everybody in place. We were dialing stuff in. And then we did one last reshoot in January for, uh, a few things that we needed for story stuff to clarify very quickly at, at Raleigh Studios and uh, and got, you know, Tony's last line and his and his big moment. And uh, and that was that was it. And we pop, you know, pop that in and, and, and delivered. And and then we just hoped that we weren't going to that everyone was going to hate us. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know. We had no idea. Right. Right. So wow. It. What an accomplishment, man. Jesus, that was that was a huge, <laughs> huge undertaking. I I mean, it just seemed to go on forever as I was, you know, reading about it and following. Yeah. So, along. well, that was so. It was, yeah. So October to answer your question, October 2016 until April 2019 was straight on working on that movie. And then uh, then, you know, once we delivered it, I went on a road trip with my kids and just didn't didn't do anything all summer. Good for fantastic. you. Yeah. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Do you ever sit down at the editing console and just think, this is just too big, too too complex. How am I going to put this together? If so, how do you overcome this? I don't, uh, only because usually, you know, you have movies are so about prep and discussions ahead of time that you don't really sit down and go, I mean, I've, I've sat down on stuff that I haven't prepped where I'm fixing it. Um, and or it's, you know, it's like a movie you come in on and you're, you're helping fix something and, you, and we have a problem here. What do we do? And you sit down. Those are those are more like mind teasers. Like you kind of go, what am I going to do here? And that's a different problem because that means that they put the movie together. They're, they're testing it and they and they need some they need like a new perspective on it. Sure. That's one. It, that's one way to execute. But when you're building something up that you're working on and you talk to the director and you have a script, it very rarely do you sit down and go, I don't know what to do. You know exactly what to do. The question is, can you do it? Right. And then and then you struggle, you know, and with visual effects movies, you can modify everything. So you can always find solutions to the problems with with stuff that's been shot straight. You know, if you can't go back out and reshoot, you've got to solve it in a creative way. Yeah. And, and sometimes that involves ADR. Sometimes it involves, you know, montage images, changing structure, repurposing scenes. That stuff's really fun to do. But those those processes happen once the movie's put together. Very rarely do those happen on the initial phase. When you're assembling something, you're still just you have faith in that original material and more often than not, it carries the day. So yeah, I, yeah. I never have that problem. I never get, I mean, I get, there's times when I get like overwhelmed in terms of like the density of the material that I get, because you want to look at everything to see if they you know, find the right, the best possible piece. Right. But that's why I've sort of adopted the storytelling approach to Daly's you know, assessment, because instead of like marking down everything that's great, I mark down everything that tells the story. That's great because <laughs> right. there's stuff that's great, but if it didn't tell the story, why am I, I can mark it, but I don't need it. Uh, I, what do I need? It, you're, you're, it's like making a shopping list when you go to the grocery store. You're like, well, I'm going to make um, a lasagna, right? <laughs> right? So I know I need 
I need, you know, cheese and I need lasagna and I need meat and I need vegetable. So, and it's a certain, you've decided what those are, right? But if you go to the store and go, I don't know what I'm going to make. I'm just going to, oh, look at that. Looks good. Here, this looks great too. This is fantastic. And pretty soon you've got a lot of meals that you can't eat. And then the food rots and no one likes it. So <laughs> I've been through both experiences, my friend. I know, me too. <laughs> So anyway, you're, yeah, no. you're, you're solving two different uh, sets of problems, you, you know, with a film that is, you know, scripted, uh, you, you know, non CGI, things like that. And then a film that has heavy visual effects and CGI. Yeah, but story, I mean, story is always figuring out the story. The best way to tell a story is not like it doesn't matter if you have visual effects or not, that the problems are exactly the same. Right. It's like, okay, yeah. you know, these it's it's always it always comes down to the same. You're, the, the, the methodology is never different. It's always like I need a shot that does this. This person's looking left. They should be looking right. Like, I mean, there's some simple things that are common to every solution. Um, and I, I, I tend to find that like when I went after Marvel, I went and did, you know, uh, Let Him Go, which was a which is sort of a gothic Western that Tom Bazooka directed with Kevin Costner and Diane Lane. And it's a very it's a very moody kind of you know, it's a period piece and it's, it's set in, um, in Montana. It's a, it's a really interesting movie and it's not, there's no visual effects in it really at all, except for some, you know, set extension kind of things, but the trying to solve the problems using sound, using music, like how do you get this emotion? Where does the music come in to get the emotion out? Where do I, this sound doesn't sound right. Like this background makes me feel one way. I should feel a different way. This bird doesn't sound right for this place. The wind right. is too loud. It's too, all that stuff is those are all the tools in your bag. Sound, you know, rhythm, color, music. All, you can use them all. And everybody has those, whether you have a visual effects movie or not. Right, right. So this is a similar question. We've all heard of the phenomenon of writer's block. Do you ever get editor's block? No, I, I don't. I mean, uh, no, I, I don't. I mean, every, every once in a while you run into a situation where there's one like the director wants one thing. The writer wants one thing. The studio wants one thing, right? You get into these situations where three there's three different voices, actor, maybe two. Like, you can get into, I've been in them before, um, not recently, but in the past, you can get into them where it's like, okay, well, <laughs> what do you want me to do? You want this. <laughs> they want that. I don't know what you, I mean, like, what is it? What are we doing? And that's not something you, that's a block, but it's a block because you need to tell me, you know, pick a lane. I can do any of these things. Here's what I think we should do, but... I can do any of these things, but it, you can't always square a circle. And if you do, you can end up with a bad movie. It very often happens where you're like, ah, it's, it's, a, we didn't want it to be too funny. We don't want it to be too violent. You know, pretty soon you, what is it? Right. <laughs> so right. that's my problem. Most of the time is, is I, you know, where are we going? And, uh, but in terms of blocking, I, yeah, I don't have a blocking problem only because, you know, I don't, I gotta, I gotta, you know, we, you know how this is. You gotta cut the scene. There's no time to be blocked. We can do like just figure something out. Start doing the something. The worst that can there. happen is you, you, yeah. I mean, just go, just start working and actually start putting things together. And I think this is something actually I learned from you many, many years ago. And I we had a conversation about it, but I took it with me forever. Which is, you know, sometimes you don't start with the picture. Sometimes you start with the dialogue. Like sometimes you just find the right line readings and they sound good together. And now all of a sudden put the picture in later. Like there's techniques to get you going. Like yeah. maybe you never, I never cut with music ever, ever, ever. Like it has to work without music. And then we'll put the music in. Some people start with music or you can play music while you're looking, look, look, you know, listening to dailies or watching dailies. Sure. That's helpful. But I never attach it in sync because you start having relationships that you have to then trade on. <laughs> I mean, I put music on once the scenes cut. Right. But if you start like, there's ways you can loosen things up and, and start the creative flow going. But um, I think it's important to just sort of, like you said, just start putting two pieces together and see how that works. Or the other thing I do is, oh, I was going to say, this is my my, my new go-to is, look at the scene. What's the most important thing in the scene? The most important thing in the scene where he says goodbye to her because he's never going to see her again. Okay, let's cut that first and then worry about how they get in the room later, right? Go to the scene where it's like, oh, he said, you know, the find the two moments that people are going to remember and then worry about where, you know, where he puts his coat. I love that. I mean, I love watching dailies and then just getting struck by, you know, a, a certain reading or, or, or right. something. And then all of a sudden, just, you know, okay, I'll that's start, the I'll moment, right? That, you know, and then I work backwards. Yeah. Well, the, I work forwards. Yeah. Walter Murch has this great thing he talks about, which is that the minute you make one cut, you reduce your number of decisions you have to make exponentially because you've already made one decision. Now, now this relationship is solved, which means you can trade on that. And it's true. Like initially you have billions of combinations, right? You make one, you make one connection, 
Now you have less and you keep doing that until you can't change a frame. If you have a scene where you're like, oh, let me take a frame out. Nope, doesn't work. If you can get to that point, you're done. You got it, right? But yeah. uh, it, it's all feeling it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So what do you like best about cutting uh, the MCU films? I What I like best is no question. Absolutely. The thing I like the best is, is working with that cast. I mean, that is the that is the that is the the totally like when you're talking about like, um, you know, luxury stuff, like the luxury of having the greatest actors on earth being in these movies is is where I get that's where I get like completely spoiled. So, yeah. oh, I have a scene and it's a superhero movie, but guess who? It's William Hurt. Oh my God. <laughs> like, wow, how can that be? He's amazing. And and the movies, he elevates the movie. The movie gets elevated. There's William Hurt. And I, I get to work with William Hurt. That's crazy. Or, you know, he's Scarlett Johansson. Like, how how hard can it be? It's Scarlett Johansson. It's amazing. Incredible mm -hmm. actress. And and she can make anything work. I don't know how she does it, but she can. Um, Downey, unbelievable. Like, that's the that's the I have to say that if I when I pinch myself, it's that I got to work with these these actors because that's what you're really that's what I'm you know, you're scrubbing that all day. You're trying to find the good moments. Well, you got a lot more good moments when you have, uh, you know, Mark Ruffalo. Yeah, there's something so inspiring about a great performance. It just makes you feel like uh, I am the luckiest person in the world to get to work on these kinds of things. And conversely, it's the yeah. opposite when you're you know trying to get blood from a stone. So I get true, it. true, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you what do you like least about working on uh, the Marvel uh, Cinematic <laughs> Universe films? Um, I like least. I got to tell you the, the the thing I I like least about the Marvel movies would be uh, working on working on location for long periods of time, like in a, like in places like Atlanta, where there's nothing wrong with it with it, but it's just I just don't like being away from home. I wish they'd shoot them in L.A. only because I want to be with my family, and I don't like to be away from my family a long time. Uh, we get to come back here and do post, which is fantastic. But but that's the only the big downside is being away a lot. I, the travel to locations is fun because you're there for a limited amount of time. It's those long stretches where you're kind of camped at a studio and it could be in Burbank, but it has to be in Atlanta because it's the tax credits and all that stuff. So, and I understand sure. that. I, I understand the, 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 the political and, and economic realities of it, but it's the one downside. Yeah, those are long stretches to be, you know, to be away. And yeah. uh, I get it. I was in Atlanta on my last film. Uh, for three months, uh, but I brought my family because I just said <laughs> I don't want to be alone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard. But yeah. you, you were there for a, what almost a year or something. It was... I was. I mean, I, I come home a lot, and sure. um, you know the technology is such that you can work in both places, and it can it can work. And but I, I, you know, I it's hard for me to make a film, especially a really important big one, with without being close to the directors. And and my kids were in school, so I didn't want to pull them out of their school while I was in Atlanta. So they came out in the summertime, but. But during school, they had to be here. So, I mean, again, it's, you know, I have to, I like to be with the directors. I like to be on set. I like to, I like to help. I got to, you know, uh, do some, some uh, work with the actors in mocap, which is, which is exciting to me because it's, you know, it's something I can help with because I'm building it. I'm building the animations myself. So sure. it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, I have a more direct line and like those kind of opportunities are exciting to do, but it's, um, um, I'd love to do them in LA. <laughs> yeah, no, it'd be nice. Let me ask you about Matthew. Uh, Matthew Schmidt has been your co-editor on several of the Marvel films, but he started as one yes. of your assistant editors. How did you two connect? Matt and I met on, okay, so it's a kind of long story, but basically I was on a movie at Fox, which was with Robert De Niro, and we were about to start shooting. It was a thriller, and uh, the movie got, they thought, that they, they, they were going to cancel the movie for some reason. I can't remember what it was, but they were mm -hmm. going to shut it down because they, they decided to not make the film. And, but they had already started, we were about to start, like we were close to the beginning of it. Um, it was like Bob was sick or something and and he had to take a break. And so they weren't sure if they could make the schedule work because he was really sick. And so they thought maybe we should just cancel it. So in the meantime, Fox didn't know what to do with me because I had already started on the movie. So I said, hey, this movie called iRobot is is in, they're, they're getting a director's cut ready and they're, and they're way behind schedule. They need some help. Would you mind helping out? Do you want to go help them? I'm like, sure, it sounds cool. It's Alex Proyas was directing it. So they sent me up. I met with Alex. He said, cool, let's let's get started. You can work on this sequence. So they gave me a sequence on iRobot and I started cutting. And Matt was the a film first on that show. And I met him there and he seemed like a great guy. And we got off. We got along great. And I really enjoyed working with him. And I left. The, I, I finished the director's cut. We showed it to the studio and and they began working on the edit. And then the, the, the De Niro movie came back online. And so I left and went back to that movie. And uh, Matt stayed on and finished our robot. So we separated. Right. And then 
in years later, I was um, I was hired on after Cap One. I got hired on Avengers, and I went to. They started shooting while we were still finishing Cap One, so they had already established a crew, and so I went to Atlanta. I'm sorry, to Albuquerque, and Matt was the first on uh, uh, on Avengers. Hmm. So uh, I, you know, and I had brought my first because it was uh, he was he was working for Paul Rubel, and I and I brought my first Kieran Palagata, and we started working. Uh, uh, there together. And I, I remember how great, you know, and how easy it was to work with him and how, how, how smart he is and how he's just a very easygoing guy. He can get along with everybody. He makes everybody feel good. And he just, he never rubs people the wrong way. And he's just freaking smart as hell about narrative and, and he can spot a bad performance a mile away. So he was just a good guy. Like I really liked working with him. And then, uh, he stayed on as the first on Avengers and, um, uh, and we we rolled right on to Iron Man three, and then on Winter Soldier, um, we you know I was trying to figure out how to organize things, and I was having such a great time with the Russos. I felt like you know we were we had such a great system going, and I needed help, but not a lot. And so we kind of decided it would be cleaner and better to just you know um, bring Matt up and have him start cutting because he knew them, he knew the material, he's he had been helping me with stuff all along. So I'm like great and he stepped up and did incredible work on that movie so it was just sort of like it was an easy kind of an easy thing from there on to to have him you know cut with me and and uh and then we ended up coming up with this great like we could hand stuff off to each other and it became very seamless and and i just like you know we just trust each other and it's easy to work together yeah it sounds it sounds like an incredibly organic transition i mean very nice super and yeah great opportunity yeah, it was super for easy yeah yeah. yeah. And I like that too. I mean, I want, I want the assistants to move up. I really do. I mean, that's, you know, Richie was always great about like, you know, opening the door and, and like letting you in and seeing what was going on and talking to you about politics and talking about working with directors and, and telling you these things that you didn't think they're not about editing. They're about, you know, personal relationships with people on a movie and politics. And that's half of it. When you learn that, uh, when you see that up close, you know, once you start to develop a little bit of that understanding that, this is how you talk to a director. This is what directors' anxieties are like. This is what they're upset about. This is what they are happy about. You start to see how that feels. And then when you get there yourself, you're like, oh, I know what this is. This is he's just upset because he had a tough day. He's not he doesn't mean it. Tomorrow will be different. I'm like, you understand that there's all those different um, you know, colors that that come out. And Matt, having been in the business for many, many years before he became an editor, had that, you know, nothing rattles him, nothing, nothing phases him. It's like, you know, once you've worked on some of these bigger movies. You're not going to get knocked over. You're you're going to be like, oh, I can handle it, yeah. and he can handle pretty much anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you you develop a you develop a tough skin, and you also yeah. develop confidence. I mean, you know, I just yeah, exactly. I just got and, an eighty million dollar movie. How wrong? You know, it's like what uh, you know, or a hundred million dollar movie. How wrong could I go? I mean, if I make a mistake, I'll fix it. You you, you get over those and, initial kinds of anxieties. Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you and you and also he's just he's. He's a leader like he can be a leader of of others. And that's an important part of the job. In other words, some people can are good editors, but they're terrible leaders. They don't know how to like say, OK, no, we're not doing this here. Visual effects. Wait, you're going to stop for a second. We're going to get this right. Sound stop for a second. You're going to do this music. I don't like that. Do this like all that stuff. Yeah. And not, you know, not pissing people off, making them feel included. That whole ability is tricky. I'm learning every day how to do that because I'm I'm not as good as Matt, <laughs> but he's great at that ability to like you know, uh, make people feel good and, and, uh, and, and also be able to say this is needed here and this is needed here, which is a huge part of the job, especially on a visual effects picture. Yeah. That was one of Richie's real strengths. I mean, he could command the yeah. ship and, and change course yeah. at a moment's notice. And I was always, yeah. you know, really impressed by, you know, there was, and a, he, well, he knew how to use all the tools. Yeah. And I was always impressed by, you know, the fact that he, you know, it wasn't about feelings. It was about the film, you know, it's like, this is what we have yeah. to do now. So uh, right. that's a great, that's a great skill. Um, tell me something. It's not on our sheet. Uh, our, it's, it's not on my question sheet, but can you talk a little bit more about the politics of the cutting room and, you know, how can people get better at it and not make mistakes that might cost them their job. Well, I think it's really important that people starting out understand the sort of um, the structure of an editing room and also that there's a chain of command. And I think it's important that, you know, when you and I were working in, in editing rooms for when in the film days, there was it was really important. It still is to have a, a really de defined chain of command. There's the editor, there's the first and everybody sort of branches out below that. But there has to be 
accountability and an understanding of who's responsible for what and and how people are being tasked because there's a ton of work so it can't just be everybody just does they, you know people need to know what they need to be what needs to be done and when and and that's what a first assistant does and the editor can't be bothered with that tasking or else they'll never get anything cut so a good first keeps the editor cutting and keeps the crew working and, and may do work themselves, but ultimately they're the person that manages that. Now we have post-production supervisors that come in as well and take over some of those, those chores and scheduling and so forth. They have to be able to work with good chemistry with the first assistant in order for that room to run well. Right. And when a room runs well, the director feels this sort of seamless, you know, great energy of things actually kind of coming together and they see the movie evolving. When a room is working poorly, the director will start to get anxious. They'll, they'll wonder when things are going to get done and why this didn't get done and why this slipped through the cracks. All that accountability and that attention to detail is critical in a movie uh, when making a movie because a movie has a million moving parts. And, you know, are the subtitles spelled correctly? Uh, did we get that change put in? Is that the right cue? Is that cue in sync? Why is this line out of sync? All those questions, you know, the audience just get shocked when they see something wrong. We as editors uh, see things wrong all the time until they're right. Um, right. But the the room, the room, you know, keeping all those details, keeping all those ducks in a row, that requires a really precise, you know, well-oiled machine. And that means you need a strong first assistant who understands the mechanics of everything and can lead that crew when the editor can't. But that, that editor has to lead by example to the first and then ultimately to the assistants as well, because ultimately the editor is accountable for all of that work. Right. So if my if my second screws something up big time and costs the production a lot of money or something gets into a movie that shouldn't be there, that's that's on me. It's right. not on them. It's Absolutely. On me. That's my that's my crew. Yeah. So that accountability chain is really important. I maintain a very strict one in my room and that, you know, I have a first that first gets it done and they have to because I can only talk. I only have time to talk to one person a day because of the hours I need to spend editing. Right. Right. So as people start their journey into editorial, are there any critical bits of wisdom you'd like to give them? Uh, any any uh, any uh, tips that they wouldn't be able to survive without? Well, I mean, I, I can't really speak to any kind of technical stuff because, I mean, there's so many things to talk about there. I mean, you just have to, you know, you have to know you have to know the computers and you have to know how things work and you have to have a basic understanding of that before you get in there. It's like, you know, it's like driving a car. If you can't drive the car, get stay off the road. But uh, if you have the basic skill set and you and you have some talent and passion, the only piece of advice I can give you is just tell the truth. Don't lie. Just be honest. And 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 if you do something wrong, fess up. If you do something right, take the credit and or actually better yet. Uh, find somebody else to give the credit to. Like, in other words, be grateful, be humble, and be honest. I mean, don't don't think that uh, this is uh, you, you didn't get handed the job. It's it's a it's a real blessing to be able to do this stuff. It's a, it's a it's a um, you're lucky to be here. I feel lucky to be here. Uh, you can honor that by just you know um, um, you know don't uh, just be, be open and honest. I think it's really important. And that's how you, that's how you gain people's trust is they, they realize you tell the truth. And that means being honest about opinions too. Like if you see a scene and you don't think it's very good and it's time to talk, go ahead and talk. But if it's not time to talk, be quiet because maybe the director and the editor are solving that problem and maybe they're not. And there's a right time to, to say, excuse me, I have an idea. And there's a wrong time. You have to learn where that is. And it's different for every editor and every director. Some directors like that, that feedback constantly. Some you are not uh, welcome until they've had a chance to work the material because they may be seeking out something that you're not. So it's always important to like, I guess that, I mean, now I've got two things to say, uh, be honest and, and be respectful about when you can speak. Yeah. Yeah. Smart. Goes back to, uh, to diplomacy and learning how to read the room and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, wow. What a treasure trove of experience and knowledge. <laughs> no, I'm not blowing smoke up your backside. Oh, thank you. This, it was fun. This is great. I mean, I remember you uh, conforming uh, dupes <laughs> on assassins and God, you've come so far and are doing so great. And hey, I'm, frankly, I'm proud of you, man. And uh, hey. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I know the $4 billion man. What can I tell you? Uh <laughs> This is, it's going to make well, a I, it was, it's a <laughs> team effort. I listen, I, 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 the Marvel is one of those things where it's like you get on that train and there's so much already, there's so many already great things going. Um, just the, the team at Marvel and the, and the quality of the work. And also, you know, you've got Disney behind it. It's just, it, it's, I, I, I'd love to take all the credit. 
Um, yeah. And I can take a little bit, <laughs> yeah. but but it, it's been it's been I've been very blessed. Yeah, yeah, it's a good place to be. Uh, I'm gonna watch the Comey uh, film, and I really look forward to seeing that Great. because it's an area of uh, interest. I've, I'm very I mean that's it's, turned out really good. I'm very proud of it. Yeah, yeah I'm be, excited uh, about that. In, uh, September on Showtime. Yeah. Okay, so thank you again for being with us. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Larry. Good to see you. <laughs>